Hi, everybody. Uh, we're all ready. Sorry, we're still getting started. Welcome to session 17. I'm Alex Ostrowski. I'm going to be moderating this session. And so to start off, we're going to have a talk by Keith Binfield from the Pure J Journal, uh, one of our local sponsors. Very much. Um, very pleased to be up here and in person at this meeting. We've supported this meeting in previous years. Uh, it's my first time attending. It's great to be a gold sponsor with the likes of AWS and Google Cloud. Finally, we made it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I'm here to talk about PJ. Um, we're a publishing company, open access publisher. Uh, I'm one of the co founders. We've been going for about 10 years now. Okay, so I went to Anton's PI talk last night, um, or yesterday afternoon, and I thought it was interesting to see this slide. I snapped a quick picture up on the back, so it's all the quality. But apparently, the three major concerns of Galaxy have been over the years accessibility, transparency, and reproducibility. And of course, uh, I'm going to claim that uh, PJ ticks all of those boxes. I think I'm the tick up on some of those references. But, um, Accessibility, you know, we're an open access publisher, of course, so we get much more accessible than that. Transparency, we require things like open data and ethical statements and, um, and so on. And we're all over reproducibility. So uh, we're one of the, um, I guess, one of the leaders in the industry for requiring open data, for um, allowing authors to have papers of limited length, for example, to put in as much information about materials and methods as they want. And, uh, DOIs, uh, state identifiers, and so on. So, uh, quickly about us then. So, yeah, we're an academic journal publisher. So we don't do books, for example. We're fully open access. Everything we do is uh, CC by 4. Uh, we're 10 years old now. And we were launched 10 years ago basically to try and, to try and come up with a publication solution for the 21st century. If, if you look at um, other publishers' websites, um, you think this was incredibly hard to do, and they're, they're sort of fossilized in the 1990s. Their peer review systems are awful, their websites are awful. So we were sort of trying to reinvent it for the, for the modern internet era. Um, and we wanted to come up with something that was as cheap as possible for authors to publish it and as high a quality as uh, they as possible. Uh, so we have a couple of the main journals. So PJ, this is the, uh, the bio journal, Life and Environment. So this publishes across the whole of biology, um, uh, health sciences, medical sciences, uh, bench research, um, field research, ecology, paleontology, environment. So a really broad scope for this one. Um, we publish about 200 articles a month. Um, and one of our strengths that really is in the areas of like bioinformatics and compile, which is obviously a strong area for the galaxy. Uh, fully indexed, it has an impact factor, for example. So both of these journals do. Uh, we were actually signatories to uh, industry industry standards that say we're not going to promote the impact factor, so I won't tell you what it is, but uh, we know it's really important for people, uh, so we like to let them know we've got one of these. But um, PJ, the Computer Science Journal, uh, so this is more recent, seven years old. This is publishing about 30 or 40 articles a month at the moment. Um, again, a large academic A4, so about 400 editors, um, including people like Big Sur, a great reach on the Advisory board, for instance, for this one, uh, which is really high quality group of projects. Okay, so that's a couple of journals. You know, they're interesting, um, but everyone everyone has journals. So, what's unique and interesting about PJ that's, that's worth you know the, the time for this talk? Um, well, we do everything that you'd normally expect from a journal publisher. You know, it's formal peer review uh, through their tutorial oversight, uh, fast peer review, so we get the first decisions in. 25 to 35 days, depending. Um, like I said, very strong requirements for data deposition. Uh, we've got a reasonably recent uh, requirement now for formal persistent identifiers for code. So um, to the individual instances of the code uh, with DOIs, meeting with Zenodo, for instance, on GitHub. Um, so we're, we're supporting those kinds of uh, requirements as well. Um, we love reproducible science, uh, negative results, uh, for instance, are available where we are. And we managed to do it all for the lowest fees in the industry. Um, we are a for profit publisher, but we're, I don't know, 40 50% cheaper than uh, the leading non profit publishers in this space. Can you step back from the microphone a little bit, please? Yeah. yeah. 
as this. Hopefully good for the people. <laughs> okay, so um, so we do what you'd expect, but we also do uh, a few things, and this is just a few of them that nobody else does. Um, so I wanted to hit on these three things in this talk. Um, so we have a, a sort of an innovative lifetime membership model. Um, we have tangible rewards for reviewers, peer reviewers, and we've got a, a very interesting publication solution for small societies, research groups, and potentially even the galaxy. So the lifetime membership model is interesting. Um, when we launched, even through today, the main way to pay for your open access publications is what's called an APC, an article processing charge. So uh, you go to an open access publisher, they do the peer review, they publish it, you pay them usually thousands of dollars to publish your article. Uh, we actually launched with a membership model, so we didn't have an APC model at all when we launched 10 years ago. But the concept of the membership model is as an individual, you become a lifetime member of PHA. You pay a single fee once, you become a member of you know, the ecosystem, and that gives you publication um, ability for free for life thereof. So um, if you buy a membership, and currently it's $399, basic membership, that allows you to publish your articles, one article per year for free for life for that one payment you ever make. The one catch, uh, is that every co-author on a paper has to be a member. So if you have, for instance, three co-authors working together, they each have to afford one of these 399 memberships, but then actually their future papers with those three people uh, you know, in, in future years are entirely free. Um, so we've got this nice infographic here of the Tunum network. So this is somebody called Rob Tunum. He's on our Ed board, but um, every time somebody joins his lab, or every time he publishes a paper, he buys memberships for those individuals out of his research grants. And over time, he's built up this you know, group of collaborators and co-authors who all have memberships now. So in the years he's been doing this, he's now funded the memberships that have funded the publication of 24 articles on that This was about a year ago, this uh, More than 50 individual authors. And the Per article publication fee at this point in time is just $665 per article. And in that network, every new article they publish is better be cheaper. Um, it, it gets lower and lower per article cost because they pay all the cost up front with the lifetime membership. So that's a really interesting, innovative uh, solution to the sort of cost problem of open access publishing. Um, we ended up also introducing an APC fee because a lot of people didn't understand this model. Um, funders wouldn't uh, fund it necessarily. You have a grant, a grant that has a limited lifetime, can fund a lifetime benefit for an author. Um, so we, we have APCs alongside this, but this is still a model that anyone can sign up to. Then, um, and I'm not going to tie these three together here. So, the next interesting thing we've got is something called PJ tokens. So, we launched this in January, uh, just earlier this year. And, uh, the concept here was that peer reviewers are uh, always complaining, um, and rightfully so, that they don't get uh, credit or payment for their peer review work. So the publishers and, and journals ask them to peer review for free. They give this peer review labor, it takes them hours or days of time to, to peer review an article, then the publisher turns around, uh, thank you very much, and publishes the article and makes some money off of it. The peer reviewer gets nothing. Um, so some, some publishers in the past have uh, as it were, awarded uh, their peer review as a discount of a future publication. Uh, we used to do that, but what we found as well was that usually the, the requirements around those things are very restrictive. Usually it's some small publication discount, it expires, so it's only any, any good if you actually intend to publish a paper with that journal. Um, if you're not interested, then what's the point? Um, so we abandoned that. Uh, concept of giving people a, a sort of publication discount to use and giving them PJ token instead. So this is an actual, almost like a currency. So when you peer review for us, or if you act as an academic editor, you get PJ tokens, and they're worth dollars. Um, so they accrue in your account, um, and you can use those dollars off of uh, future publications. So, so at some level, somewhat similar to the previous concept, but the, the clever bits here are that they never expire. So they sit in your account for crew forever. You can combine them with other individuals. So if you've got, again, three or four co-authors on paper, you've all earned you know, 100 or $200 of credit, you can combine them together and get a free publication. 
or you can transfer them out entirely to some other entity, some other individual in the internet. You can sell these to somebody on Twitter, um, or you could donate them to some uh, research collaboration, for instance, or a group of people who are happen to be publishing with us because you're not and you don't need that discount. So these are really been well received actually. Uh, just launched in January, but people I think really see the value of this. So people's tokens have only been accruing since January. Um, but already we've had many people who basically accrued enough tokens or, or um, imported them in from other users in the system to warrant free publications. So tying those two things together, the membership model, the, the tokens model, um, we have the final thing I could talk about is PJ hubs. So this is a really nice solution that we've come up with um, for societies, small societies or research organizations or Communities like Galaxy, for example, which is why we talk about here, um, who want a uh, want publication solution for themselves and their members. So they're a smallish society, you know, they've probably got you know, um, some number of members, they're charging some membership fee, but they don't have a house journal, they don't have any way to sort of reward those uh, members for their, their membership in the society by giving them discounts of publication, uh, they don't have a voice for their, for their research field. Um, many publishers now are not launching new journals for societies like that. It's just not cost effective for them anymore. So a lot of these societies are basically stuck. You know, they, they want some sort of publication. Nobody will launch it for them. They don't want to launch it themselves because they don't know how to publish, but also launching a new journal takes years to establish itself. It's taken us you know, 10 years to get PJ to where it is. Um, it takes many years to get indexed properly and so on. So if you're a society, you can come to us and sign up for a PJ hub. And um, we've got the first one launching next month with uh, this association, IARBO, uh, Biological Ocean. So the basic concept there is that this society encourages their um, society members to submit to this PJ hub, the IARBO hub. Um, the society themselves can then vet those submissions as they come in. They can say that these either are or aren't in scope for our society, or these people aren't members or are members of our society. Uh, pre approve them to go into the sort of process of peer review. Peer review then happens with any of our journals. So, if it's a computer science article, it could happen with a computer science journal, or you know, oceanography article, a bio journal. Um, and uh, it goes through the normal peer review process and pops out the other end as a published article. Uh, while it's in peer review, the society themselves can actually oversee that peer review. The society can put their members on our editorial board to be an editorial board within the board. So, uh, in many ways, I think of this as a journal within a journal. Um, what comes out the other end are all the articles that have been sort of pre-approved and pre-peer reviewed uh, on behalf of this society, IARBO, or you know, uh, try and think of the word galaxy instead of IARBO, the galaxy community, uh, articles that have come out of your, you know, your tool. Um, and you end up with a landing page on the journal, so the articles are now um, published in that journal, also published in this hub which is closely branded to the society, to the group. Um, those articles, are, you know, they, they come born with an impact factor, for instance. They're in a journal, it's indexed straight away. You, know, you don't have to wait years for the journal to establish itself. Um, and the kind of thing, actually, with the tokens then, the tokens and the membership scheme, which I mentioned before, is that when society members submit into this hub, they get a discount, a publication discount, which uh, comes in the form of tokens. Those tokens can be donated back to the society. So in the case of somebody like Ayabo, they may say, well, you know, I, I don't want that publication discount myself as an author. I'll give it back to the society. The society then has a pot of uh, tokens, dollars, credits that they can then hand out to their, you know, uh, perhaps more worthy recipients in their society membership, you know, students or people from the developing world. And so, on. so with that, um, so sort of ecosystem of the membership model, the tokens, the hubs, we think we've got a really nice little open access solution for you know, groups of researchers, um, uh, communities like galaxies, small societies, medium-sized societies uh, that can really you know, flip around some of the publication. Uh, so those are the things I wanted to hit on. Uh, we are also just a regular publisher, scan that QR code and get a discount, uh, APC discount. Um, I've spoken to a couple of the PIs, I spoke to Bjorn about the possibility of you know, us partnering with Galaxy. I'd love to talk to anyone about that option if uh, anyone has an interest. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn. Thank you, Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Did someone add your 
six co authors. Does that blow your once a year uh, ability to? Uh, what was the first part? Sorry? So, if someone adds you as oh. a co author, yeah. does that take your once a year allowance? Yes. So, each co author uh, with the basic membership gets a once a year allowance. And if you're a co author on a paper, that, that counts. But then there are higher tiers. So, for just uh, $4.99, so just $100 more, you can publish up to five articles a year, which nobody does anyway. Um, but it, it's not much more to basically to go to the unlimited plan. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Uh, have you seen any increase in collaboration between people who have already paid into, into the system who already have accounts that haven't worked together otherwise? So, yes, actually. Yeah. Um, Do you mind repeating so the question? That, that one infographic I have with the big network effect. So, uh, we did a nice blog post with Rob Tootman. And, um, uh, because every person who comes into his lab, he hands them a membership, you know, they then leave that app in future and uh, sort of as well promotes the existence of this membership to, to new colleagues. And um, I think they, they've, uh, you know, they've as it were, encouraged colleagues to publish with us instead of elsewhere. So there's that kind of collaboration that's, that's been enhanced, I think, and improved by this sort of network effect. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. We're going to have a three minute break before we begin the talks for the final part of the session. Uh, Jen would like to remind everybody that if you have a talk tomorrow, please send her her slides by the end of tonight. Another publishing site that uh, 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 which they have uh, 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 Talks for the day. Uh, first up is Marius from the Penn State Lab. Yep. Thanks. Um, yeah, this time around, I'm presenting uh, work that has been met by uh, Simon Bray, who uh, should be here uh, now, but I mean, I'm, I'm going to present the slides. So, um, so yeah, 
That's fine, right? um, the IWC or Intergalactic Workflow Commission uh, is a community for uh, high quality guides and workflows. We presented this uh, last year and this quick update on uh, where we're standing now, what we're doing, and some really cool stuff we've added uh, recently. So um, you may be more familiar with the IUC, the Intergalactic Utilities Commission, which um, is maintaining uh, tools, curating, updating. Um, and what the IWC aims to do is sort of be that same entity, but for workflows. So we do continuous integration testing um, with Planemo. Uh, we do deployment to Dog Store and use Galaxy Star. So um, you can find the workflows either the registry or directly in the server. Um, there is a wide range of scientific workflows, and we absolutely want your workflows. Um, but right now we have SARS CoV 2 workflows. We have a generic variant calling workflow. We have a genome assembly uh, workflows for BGP. And that's just the start. There are more coming. We have a molecular dynamics and free uh, energy calculation workflows. And we really do want your workflows as well. <clears throat> so on the right, you can see how uh, that looks like in Dog Store. We also have updates uh, to Workflow Hub. These are nicely versioned and updates. So this is all really, really cool. So workflows are continued to be reviewed um, via GitHub. Um, and workflows, they can be built in the UI or they can be uh, handwritten. Um, and the same is true for the tests. Um, this used to be a little bit tricky because uh, you have to remember sort of the syntax and while it's similar to um, the tool tests, um, I think a lot more people are familiar how to write tools. Um, so there is always that little thing um, that you have to look it up. And I also always need to look it up when I work for tests. Um, but we made this a lot easier uh, recently. So uh, Simon added this uh, workflow test in it command um, that will generate the definition of the inputs and the definition of the test case based on the previous invocation. So all you need to do is um, make the workflows ready. Um, the best practice sort of checks, and then you will find some small, um, ideally small input data that you can run your workflow with. And um, when you're done, you just fetch the invocation ID um, and you run that command, and that will give you uh, the test setup. And it's it's really cool, uh, saves a lot of time, and we're also going to try to automate this even further so that people can just say, "Hey, here's an invocation." and um, also, in a way that we show the creative thing, maybe, and then we can do the actual uh, scientific review. Um, so, yeah, um, the whole process is uh, PR based. So, you open a PR, we review it, um, it essentially, eventually, we'll, we'll merge it. Um, but then the next thing pops up because it's not enough to just do that. You also want to maintain it, um, you want to make sure uh, it authors improve the tools that the workflows recently for those updates. So how can we do that? Um, well, we have automated uh, tool updates from the command line now. Um, so there is the planning more auto update command. So you can point that at your uh, workflow. Um, and then it will spin up uh, a transient Galaxy instance and um, find which tools can be updated and, and we'll do that. Um, or we can also target uh, a Galaxy server. And so it will get updated to the latest versions uh, available on that Galaxy server. Um, so that builds, the functionality builds on the workflow refactor actions that uh, John added. And it's strictly equivalent to uh, hitting the upgrade workflow option in the workflow editor. Um, but what having this um, Amigo command enables us is to put that into uh, continuous integration and run that. Uh, at certain times, we can time that kind of daily or once a week or once a month, depending on how much uh, time, um, <laughs> depending on uh, how often we want to uh, create these updates, actually. Uh, so that's done with uh, a GitHub bot, um, and it also uh, prints out a list of uh, tools that have changed. And uh, yeah, the, the action also removes uh, obsolete uh, inputs and outputs. It's also taking good care 
um, keeping the step positions the same so the workers are actually uh, reviewable and it's not like everything's shuffled around um, as what would often happen if you did all of that manually in the user interface. So that um, brings me to the final slide, um, showing you a little bit the, the bigger picture of how we can uh, maintain and sustain uh, workflows. I mean, we don't have that many workflows yet. We want to be able to maintain and host many, many more. Um, and this applies to the IWC, but you can like, you can start communities like that um, if, if you prefer that. Um, so the basic thing is that there's a source code release on, for instance, GitHub. Um, then uh, Bioconda already monitors the upstream source for uh, new releases when uh, it finds a new release. Um, there is a pull request created, created against Bioconda. This just needs a review, so if everything's passing, all you need to do is somebody needs to say this is good. Uh, thumbs up, merge it. Um, that creates the Bioconda package without any further intervention. At the same time, um, a new bio container uh, will be created. So that's both Docker and uh, Singularity. So the Singularity is on our uh, CDMFS uh, file system. Um, and so that's sort of the larger community um, thing going on. And then uh, once we have new Bioconda packages, we have a bot that will update the Galaxy tool and create a pull request against the IUC. Uh, so again, that's going to be review. We'll make sure the tests still pass. We still get the expected outputs. Um, we also typically read like the change log to know, you know, are, are there new significant options that need to be added or anything that's a red flag. Uh, when that looks good, we'll uh, merge it. Then uh, Planino will uh, update the tool in the tool shed, and uh, we'll period periodically update the Galaxy server with all of the new tools. And then uh, this presentation now showed, showed the, the last part for the Galaxy uh, workflows, which is that once we have the update of the Galaxy tools, we watch the toolshed for um, updates. And uh, again, this will create a pull request uh, with the workflow and the updated tools. And uh, we'll review that, merge it. And once it's merged, uh, the Galaxy workflow will be updated on the Galaxy server and we'll update the uh, workflow uh, repositories. So that's that's a strategy that will allow us to maintain workflows, make sure they're current, um, and that they will be able to solve your scientific needs. All right. Thank you. First, right, that's really interesting. I'm excited for it. But one of the things we advocate to users is Galaxy might change the tool on you, but if you say the workflow, that tool version is essentially fixed. Mm -hmm. how, how are you going to propagate versions through? Do we use the versioning inside Galaxy so users can just see what version this is, or are you tending to completely replicate versions? So the workflows will have their can have their own versions. So the version uh, of the workflow itself is going to be bound, and we also create a change log to wait for every change, so that this is individual uh, changes. So I mean that's actually an area of improvement. We have the change log, um, which it should be more visible when you look at it. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Marius. <laughs> Uh, excellent. Now we have Ben Yu from the University of Michigan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ben Shao from the University of Michigan. First of all, I would like to thank the science community for giving me this opportunity to give uh, to present this our work in GCC. And uh, this is the first time I attended GCC, and uh, our work is mostly about proteomics. And uh, uh, it might be a little bit different from all the other presentations in GCC. Hopefully, I want to get you guys lost. 
So red red present uh, their work about the writing a wiper of red heavy galaxies. So in this presentation, I will talk about what exactly red heavy is and what it can do. In our world, red heavy is a one of uh, data analysis suite for the premix. This is basically what a uh, red heavy looks like. It has a GUI. It is for the massive geometry data analysis, and it has several tabs. In each tab, there are like one or several tools to finish certain tasks. And uh, some of the tools is from our lab, and some are from the other labs. And then in the following slides, I will highlight several of the tools from our lab. The first one is uh, MS Fragger. MS Fragger was published a few years ago, and it is a database searching tool for panel applications. After so the, these years uh, improvement, it can do the mass calibrations and it also supports the DDA classic data. For the mass calibration, it, 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 it can collaborate the mass for the MS1 and MS2. Here's an example from the paper published in 2020. So basically, we have a data with very big mass error in MS1 and MS2. So after the calibration, as you can see, the, the error Basically, it was it is centered to zero, and the variance of the error is, is smaller than the original ones for both MS1 and MS2. Then we use the data set from the team stop data classic to demonstrate that MS Brother has a higher sensitivity. Basically, we use the peaks and max count as benchmarks. Both peaks and max count are very widely used tools in real communities. And we, we use them as benchmark, and this is a head chain. Is indicated that the search is from the semi informatic search. The non hydrogen bars are from the informatic search. So, both peptide wise and protein wise comparison shows that MS Burger has, has a higher sensitivity. And then we also perform the long term comparison. The conclusion also is like uh, MS Burger is faster than them. Other than the conventional closed search, MS Burger can also perform open and offset, offset search. Uh, open search basically is search the peptide with a very wide mass range. And the big mass differences can be interpreted as a unknown modifications. For example, if you see a mean, bigger difference is equal to 80 Dalton, you probably guess it is a phosphorylation, something like that. And it is very good for the novel, more novel modification discover. And then MS Project can also perform the offset search. The offset search basically is search certain large. Is a mass range, not a continuous range of the mass. So it can be notch equal to zero, which basically you don't allow any modifications, and plus notch equal to 16, which is oxidization and 80, phosphorylation, something like that. So with offset search, we know exactly what the MSP is searching. And because the search space is smaller than open search, so we probably will have a higher accuracy and a higher sensitivity. With the offset search, we extend MS Fragger to make the support black of peptide and efficiencies. We basically give MS Fragger a very big list of the black solutions and let them search all those black solutions notch one by one. And during the search, MS Fragger, MS Fragger also uh, supports the black peptide specific ions, such as the diagnostic ions, and those labile ions, non labile ions, and capital Y ions, which are specific to the black peptides. And uh, after the MS Fragger search, we also we can also do the glycan assignment in a tool called PTM Shepherd. PTM Shepherd is also a tool from our lab. And then it, uh, in the latest version, it has a glycan assignment module that can take the information from diagnostic ions, capital Y ions, isotopic arrows, math to infer the glycan compositions and also estimate the FDR. And then after talking about the MS Fragger, I would like to introduce our new tool named MS Booster. It is a tool for the deep learning based scorings. It, 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 it basically takes output from MS Fragger and then get a capital list. And then you and then it predict the MS2 spectral and retention time for each of the peptide in that list using the deep learning. And then it compares the experiment data from the users against the predicted spectrum. And then can put a bunch of additional scores, such as the spatial similarities and the differences, such as that. 
And as always, additional deep learning based scores together with the MS brain original scores are fitted to calculate in the first step. Calculator is a tool from the other lab. It is right now widely used in programs communities. It's basically take a bunch of a score and a train an SBM model. This model can have a better separation of the true and cross scale types and a probably not most of the time it has a fair significance. So we, we, we use these additional deep learning scores. Our experiment indicated that it can boost the sensitivity of the HRI data analysis and the DI data analysis. Here's a typical example of the HRI data analysis with and without MS booster. So here's a very big overlap, as we can show, uh, as we can see in this diagram. And then in order to show that all those additional capacitors are likely to be true, we analyze the motifs of those additional capacitors. And then, oh, I'm sorry. And compare them with the uh, shared ones, and then the motif pattern looks similar. It probably indicates that those those those, those new finding peptides are, are correct. After talking about after speaking about the identifications, I would like to spend a few minutes about the quantification. So we developed a tool named Iron Quant that can perform label free quantification and acceptable the labeling quantifications. Iron Quant right now is also in part of that uh, label type. In one tab. And then this, this slide basically shows the demonstrated the performance of the of, of the iron pump. And then, again, Max Corn is used as benchmark since it is being widely used in the community. So we have data, we use the data set to have two experiments A and B showing here. So each experiment has a protein from three species, and uh, but the ratios of the protein from those three species are different. For the human, it's one to one. For the yeast, it's two to one. And for the E. coli, it's one to four. So basically, we know the ground choose ratio of those proteins. So then we can use this information to evaluate the accuracy and the precision of our of those tools. And uh, this kind of comparison shows that uh, I quantify more, more proteins with uh, a little bit of few less outliers. And then we also evaluate. The performance of the isotopic level of quantifications using another data set. This time we use a heavy and a heavy and light label data set, and then we mix them with the null ratios. And there are one to one ratios, four to one ratios, and one to ten ratios. And this time we use Scala as a benchmark. We didn't we didn't use Nextcon because Nextcon actually doesn't support this kind of data type. And Scala is also a widely used uh, tool for the quantitative economics. It has a very, 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 very large user base. Uh, this experiment, as you can see, this uh, plot shows that red pipe, <coughs> which is, 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 is shown as SP, compar is this comparable or slightly better than the skyline, which is SK in the figure here. Then let's go to, uh, let's, let's go to the DI data analysis. So I'm not sure if, if you know the differences of the DDI and the DI. Basically, the DDI, DDI for each DDI spectrum, you know the mass, the total mass of the peptide you collect for each kind of mass spectrum. But for the DDI, it's kind of multiplex things. So the single MS spectrum have more than one peptide in it, and you don't know what the mass are they. So analyzing DDI data is kind of a little bit different from analyzing DDI data. So recently, we we extend MS Fragment to make it a support to make it a support uh, DI data. So if we have a DI data, it can search against search it against a uh, sequence database directly without any prediction or any special library. And then after the MS Fragment search, it can the, the, the result can be used by the MS first and pick it and then at their filterings. So the filter library can be used to build a special library. Special library is very widely used in DI data analysis because there are, there are tools that can take the special library as a template to extract the peptide chromatography features from the DI data and the quantifications. So there will be a special library and DI data. We can quantify the peptide and protein point. If the user have DDA and DI, we can, we can search both of the types altogether use MS program all the way down to the special library. Then this kind of hybrid special library can take the from both DE and DI, and then can be used for quantifying 
the peptide from DDA data. And then our, our experiment shows that this hybrid library always gives more peptides, more quantified peptides than the pep library from the uh, purely from the DDA or purely from the BIA. Then, okay, and this really can, that's basically what this record can do. So the highlights, it can, it can do DDA and DI data analysis, it can do the conventional search, open search, and black data search, it has a different screen and it also support all kinds of conditions. And, and then we also developed several um, dozens of the workflows to support all kinds of applications, including those which I'm showing here, such as uh, TMT analysis, select data analysis, economic data analysis. So people might want, okay, the fractal can do a lot of things. So what if we want to use it in HPC clusters, or in the web server, or in Galaxy, for example, or processing many, many jobs in batch. I don't want to inter interact with the theory at all. So we always listen to the user's feedback, and then we always want to make them happy. So we get the fractal headless mode to it. The fractal headless mode and the theory mode basically share the same color base. The only difference is one, if Fractal initiated the theory module when it starts, and two, how it takes input from the users. If the user uses theory mode, it takes input from theory. If it uses the headless mode, it takes input from the workflow file and manifest file. So workflow file basically contains all the parameters for the analysis, and the manifest file contains the path of the user's specialization data and the experimental groups. So with, with this mode, Users can run Fractal with a single command, and this command can be easily put it in the Galaxy uh, system to run in the background. And the, the front one can be a website taking all the parameters. Finally, I would like to thank Alexei Nizbenski group and all those awesome group members working with me and working on the Fractal development. I also would like to thank all those collaborators, some of them developed the tools that are used by Fractal. Now some of them have the project that are using grant power. And then I also would like to thank the NIH and the NCI for the grant. Thank you. Excellent. Any questions? So, so, so one question I have is uh, in terms of MS Fragger, it seems to give a uh, lot more indications as compared to Max or other what do you think contributes more to it? Is it uh, calibration? Is it open search or is it the MS tools that you use? What are what are the components which contribute to increase detection of bias? And can you repeat the question, please? Thank sure. Is the question, if I answer correctly, is that what kind of compressor am I using in this figure in my life? Yes, I mean, there are quite a few features in MS Tracker which seem to boost the number of identification. Uh, so what so for these comparisons, we, we did an effort to effort comparison. We didn't do we didn't perform any open source or semi-internet search. Oh, yeah. If we perform semi-internet search, it's a corresponding to also do the same thing here. So here is all about close search. We didn't involve any open search because neither MaxCon or MaxCon at least does not very well support open source. So all the sensitivity is, 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 is basically due to the spectrum, is from the spectrum processes and from the scorings, all those kind of detailed things. It's not about the model of the search. So actually, we're, we're running a little bit behind the time. So do you mind posting it on the Slack and we can continue from there? Sure. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and next we're uh, next is Mathieu. <laughs> uh, Thank you. So we'll stay in the field of mass spectrometry. Where the, the main goal or general goal is to actually identify unknown compounds in a sample. And during this process, which we will not talk about here, we basically uh, obtain a spectrum for every compound found. 
and we associate this uh, with metadata. This metadata is actually what identifies the pump compound, and we can see that it is a set of some typical chemical identifiers such as chemical formula or smiles, inchi, and this kind of stuff, or, or also some um, specific database identifiers such as outcome ID, agent TV ID, and so on. Um, the, the issue is that um, in the mass spec libraries, these metadata are often very reduced and a lot of information is missing, or identifiers are missing. And so what we actually did is we developed a tool which um, is trying to extend this, uh, this set of metadata by finding the, the identifiers in some databases and using services. So this is, this is an overview of the tool. It's called MS Meta Enhancer. Uh, so basically, what it does is pretty simple. It takes a mass spec library, which contains some specific data, which is annotated by these identifiers. It runs them through an annotation process, and we get the output, which is basically the same data, just enriched with more metadata. Um, the annotation steps, annotation process, is composed of so-called conversions. Uh, so basically, what we want to do is specify uh, how we want to obtain a new uh, identifier. So we have in our metadata we already have some known identifiers. So this is a source. Then we basically want to find something new, so that's the target, and we want to do it using a service. This service is typically a web, a web service. You uh, access it either via an API, or it can be also a compute engine because some identifiers can be like, computationally inferred from another one. Uh, this process is semi automatic. The reason is that uh, the user can have some additional knowledge about the data. Like, first of all, he has to define, like, what are his targets, what identifiers he wants to obtain, but he also can know some additional information, such as, well, when I will search this database, I will probably get most of the stuff I want. And then I can try these you know, secondary sources, which might help to, I don't know, fill the gaps. So that's why it's kind of like semi-automatic, but there is also a mode where the user can just decide, like, Let's run, let's try everything and we will see what we get. Um, so this annotation process is sort of iterative. Since we are mostly querying some uh, web services, uh, it's done in an asynchronous way because, well, we are waiting, we are waiting a lot of time for the request, uh, for the responses. And also, as you can see, it's seen in the scheme, there is also some pre-processing and post-processing called creation and validation, uh, which is basically trying to ensure that the identifiers are in a correct form. So we, for example, don't query a database with some, with some, I don't know, random string. And also in the output, we want to avoid uh, give, giving the user some data which doesn't really make sense. And finally, we work the tool uh, in that tool. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, the user can specify the order in, in which he wants to execute these individual conversions. So, so we used uh, a single select, select conversion in a big mode. So, we can uh, iteratively add uh, more conversions and always just select one. In this way, we can reserve the order, the order of the conversions and the annotation can run in this way. But this, it's also possible to use this multiple select to just randomly pick uh, conversions you want. And these um, are basically run after the order runs in basically random order. So these are those which will be like, let's try it, we will see. And the user can also like select all possible conversions. And these are basically a specified list based on the supported services and supported identifiers, which can be 
modularly extended as we wish. So uh, here are some useful links regarding the tool. And if you want to know more, more there is also a demo tomorrow. And thank you. All right, any questions? If uh, one of the resources you requested didn't happen to have an identifier, uh, does it just come back as a null field or empty field then? Yeah, so the Could you repeat is, the, yeah, yeah. So the question is what happens is if, well, one of the conversions basically fails because the service doesn't provide the identifier we want. Well, basically we, we just continue with the next step, with the next conversion. And since it's like iterative process, it might happen that some of the conversions will have help us to obtain some additional identifier. And then when we run it again, maybe this time it, it will succeed, but maybe not. There is a, a log file where all these processes are like detailed, explain what will happen when, and you can go back and see what happens. All right, thank you. Here today, we have Nuno Pula Valeri from MCDI. Again, I trust the share button. Okay, so we're going to leave the world of mass spec and talk about butterflies and pairs and nuts. So, um, yeah, my name is Nuno I'm from MCDI, and um, pleasure to be here. It's my first Galaxy conference in person, I attended last year. Um, and as Anton mentioned yesterday, we've been collaborating over the last year to incorporate data sets into, um, into Galaxy, and it's been a really, really nice collaboration. So I'm going to start by giving just a background on what data sets is and why we started the project. And then towards the end of the talk, I'll, uh, I will focus on what we've done with Galaxy. So first off, what is NCBI data sets? Well, the project has started this very lofty goal of making it easier to find data with an NCBI. And um, we started around the end of 2019. And um, to where we are right now is that we provide a new way to get um, data for our genomes, genes, and other log sets. And also, we have a special SARS CoV 2 data set. So, why did we even start this project? Well, uh, for anyone that's used NCBI, you know that um, as data increases, it gets larger, data gets more complex. Um, this has been a real burden on the repositories in order to not only keep up with the data, but Make sure that our interfaces um, can serve the people that are coming in and trying to download this data. So this project um, took on the goal, the goal of uh, creating new um, web interfaces as well as programmatic interfaces for finding and retrieving NCBI data. Uh, in addition to creating the, the interfaces, the way we deliver the data, we also um, made some made some changes to to deliver data that is complex. Now there's multiple file types. There's diverse metadata. So to package this data uh, in a coherent package of sequence of metadata. And we also wanted that metadata to be documented. So we, all the metadata that we have in our packages has have documented schemas that are published um, on our website. And part of this project is also to work closely with users. So this is a really important thing for us to, to develop very, very much out in the open and reach out to people and get their feedback and not develop something that was kind of useless. <coughs> So this is a, our homepage. If anyone wants to learn anything about data sets, you can just come to our homepage. It's the NCBI URL slash data sets. Um, as you can see here in this image, this is, this is the web interface, what you can use to search for genomes or genes. You can search by organism. We have autosuggest. We you know, accept all those terms that people, uh, people know. And if you look at the uh, navigation bar at the top here, we have these portals to enter to look for taxonomy, to look for genomes, genes, we also have a command line tool, which I'll get to in a second, um, and our documentation pages. So anything you need to know, please just go look at that um, web page. So what data do we actually deliver? Um, as I mentioned, these data is more complex. So we have these different data packages. I'm going to introduce this term, which we use throughout data sets, which is called the data package. And whenever you download from data sets um, through any of our interfaces, you're going to get a zip archive that contains data that you chose. So it's going to contain the FASTA sequence or annotation files. Um, and it's also going to contain a metadata file. All our metadata files are in data mines format. And these, um, these metadata files are, um, you know, we've, we've, if you think of a, uh, a data set like a genome, metadata is often scattered across the different databases within NCBI. It can be an assembly database or by a sample or by a project. 
So what we try to do with these metadata files is to bring all that data together in a coherent um, structure. So, um, so again, with, no matter what interface you're using, you're going to get the same data. So we, so as we try to these web interfaces, because we know that's where most biologists are, we know that we would like to get people over to using the command line because the data gets more complex. Um, programmatic options are really the, the best way forward for a lot of people. So we've also invented or <laughs> created a command line tool. We actually have two tools. Um, so here I'm showing a schema. This is in our documentation. This is our data sets command line tool. And we wanted this tool to also be very intuitive, much like our web pages. So um, it's broken down by downloading. So that's actually getting the data. And then we also have a summary command, which allows you to browse the metadata. And it's pretty, it's pretty simple structure. It's again, genome, ortholog, gene, and that virus service. And um, we have, it's just a it's high level command and then sub commands and flags. And we, the inputs are, you know, common terms like accessions, you can input by taxon, you can input by usually most of the NCBI identifiers. Um, and one thing I just want to point out here is on the bottom here, there's, there's a, a command called rehydrate. Um, for those that are looking for very large amounts of data, we have implemented this thing called the dehydrated package. So you can use the flag of dehydrated. And um, what you get then is a, uh, a zip archive that has the metadata file and then has fetch files for the actual data. And you can download that and then you can go back into the rehydrate <laughs> to, uh, to realize those data files. And um, the advantage of this is there's a lot of retries built in. It also does the downloads in parallel. So it's a much faster experience if you're looking for something like salmonella genomes or primate genomes or something very large. So, um, so our, our met, for our metadata files, you know, JSON lines is a very much a, um, a machine readable format, uh, and that's not you know, it's not like human readable. So, what we've done is create this uh, other tool called Data Format, and Data Format takes in those metadata files, those JSON lines files, and allows you to output a TSV. So you can just put in field names that you um, are interested in. And again, this is these field names are all in our documentation. And you can use data format then to, to output a, a TSP file. So again, we have a documentation page. And within our documentation, we have um, the reference section. We also have an open API that's, um, under the reference section uh, of our documentation. And we have how-to guides, which we are we're building as we talk to users, you know, trying to build them, you know, workflows for going through um, and using data sets. We also have a GitHub site, and then there you can find um, Jupyter notebooks. We have a training folder where we have um, we have built uh, tutorials and training from uh, various workshops that we've run. So, what are we doing with Galaxy? Um, so in the last year, we have incorporated our genome service into Galaxy. So here I'm showing um, what the interface looks like. And I just want to highlight that there can be several tools within Galaxy that are called NCBI something. Um, we're NCBI data set, so it's hard to figure out which ones we are. Um, and so that's the interface and the way you use it is you go in and you select the genome you want. You can do that by taxon, you can do it by assembly, you can do it by, by a project accession. Then you go in and you can filter. You can filter by just the reference uh, genomes, the annotated genomes, source database. This one is often a confusing one. We have both the gen bank database, which is the submitted data, data and then we have the RESTI, which is the uh, annotation type ones that we run by NCBI. So you can choose whether you want those RESTI files or gen bank files. Chromosome release day, we have different, different filters. And then you choose the files that you want. We have a selection of most of the files that we have available on NTB. And then once you've selected your files, you have a new history and you can go ahead and use those files for any sort of workflow. So where we are right now is we're very interested in building workflows. We, you know, data sets is about getting the data um, and those downstream uh, workflows that people have are very interesting collaborating with people to build these and these workflows in Galaxy. So coming up, we have in the test server Galaxy, you can see our game service, our workflow, and our SARS-2 service. Um, and uh, and this, this project is under very active development. Um, we have, uh, we're already looking across the NCBI databases and, um, and you know, continually adding improvements and adding additional data. So um, we do really, really want to hear from people that are using this, if there's data missing, if there's you know, any aspect of it that's not, uh, not easy to use or something seems to be just missing. Lastly, I'd like to thank my team 
ASS team and thank you to Twin Galaxy for the nice working with you over the last year. And again, contact us, that's my email. We also have a feedback button on our pages and uh, a feedback button is not a black hole. We look at it every day and we try to respond to people within 24 hours. And one last thing I want to mention is uh, we have a new initiative at NCDI called the Cabrera Genome Resource, um, which we are part of. Um, and part of this uh, initiative is developing um, kind of, it's, it's trying to um, take our in-house tools that we have for contamination screening and for um, genome annotation pipeline and make these tools uh, available to the public and they will be very interested in, in the Galaxy community as we help. So thank you all very much and I'll take any questions. time so if you have any other further questions please send them on slack thank you very much our final talk today we have another second from the forever class everyone. Um, I'm going to be presenting this R&D convolution tool that uh, the event has put together. Uh, and um, yeah, so um, I you're probably wondering what R&D convolution actually is. And uh, essentially, you have your bulk RNA data sets and don't necessarily know what the cell composition is. And uh, this is information that you normally don't really have, but you can infer it by uh, clustering methods or by taking an existing single cell RNA seq data set, um, extracting uh, the uh, cell type from either previously clustered data or just um, other methods, and then fitting this uh, these expression profiles onto your bulk RNA samples and um, getting uh, these different cell type compositions um, in, in your bulk data. And uh, the reason you might want to do this is because maybe you find a specific like rare cell type in your single cell and you want to check whether or not it's real, so you can then just download publicly available bulk RNA data sets and uh, check to see whether you get any hits for this rare cell type in the bulk data. And uh, also if you want to compare different um, tissues, so like uh, disease tissues or healthy tissues, and you want to see what the cell type composition would be uh, between those two, then, then this is also a way to do that. Um, also, it's, it's just a much cheaper than doing single cells. So if you just have bulk data and you just want to put it in it, you can just um, take an existing single cell um, a publicly available single cell data set and then um, try to fit that onto your onto your bulk RNA-seq data. Um, so the tool that we chose was called Music and uh, Multi-Subject Single Cell Decomposition. Um, it's actually not the only music in Galaxy, there's another one, but uh, this one is with the weird capital lettering stuff, so it's more unique, I guess. Um, and the way it works is that uh, essentially you just take uh, single cell data sets from uh, many different subjects and then it looks for um, consistent um, cell types between the single cell data set, sorry, consistent um, clusters, I guess. And um, it tries to um, infer informative genes just by looking for cross-subject mean and cross-subject variance and by um, 
using these informative genes, it builds a gene expression profile for all the cell types that you have there. And then you can use this to fit against your healthy uh, bulk RNA seq data or your disease RNA seq data and yeah, compare um, the different cell types. Um, so why did we choose music instead of other deconvolution tools in Galaxy? Well, there was this benchmark paper in 2019, and they compared many different kinds of um, deconvolution tools. And uh, deconvolution tools come in actually three types. So there is reference-based, which is essentially what I explained here before, where you have uh, yeah, your single cell RNA seq data is already clustered, and you're just fitting it onto your bulk RNA seq. And uh, there is also reference-free, where it literally just have your bulk RNA data and you are um, just trying to cluster the data intrinsically. And um, I mean, you can actually kind of see that this is not really the great, greatest way to do this because um, CAMPRI and Linseed are reference-free methods and they don't tend to score very well uh, in these benchmarks. And oh, sorry, and the benchmark itself was uh, we just took simulated data, did some very um, noise profiles and then just checked the, the peers and correlation. And, um, one other way is marker gene um, based analysis, where you just you just feed a, a, a bunch of marker genes and then it tries to infer cell type from that. But uh, I think that that was DSA and that also didn't score very highly. Um, so the mark, no, sorry, the reference based methods were the, some of the best methods, CyberSort and Music and Timer. Uh, but Music was special in the sense that you didn't actually have to feed it a set of differentially expressed genes as well. You could just infer um, cell types purely from the single cell data that you try to fit onto it. And uh, another reason music was chosen simply was because it actually had a combo package and there were materials. And I mean, some of these other tools just simply did not have that. I mean, some of them were written in MATLAB, so that's completely a no-go for wrapping something in Galaxy, I think. Um, and yeah, some of the others hadn't been updated in many years. And yeah, I mean, I, I think if you're a tool developer, you're very familiar with just the general workflow of wrapping a tool. Or does it have a condo environment? If not, can it be easily wrapped? If so, I mean, then are there other is it well documented? Other examples? Um, and if so, then you can actually make a nice galaxy tool from that. Um, so the first rendition went surprisingly quickly. Um, I just took the tool as it was. I wrapped the materials that they had, and I reproduced their entire their entire workflow in, in Galaxy. So you could, um, here you see like one plot where you see, I don't know, uh, the proportion of alpha and beta or gamma cells in, um, I think there's like 79 RNA samples there. And it produces a nice heat map, we have a nice workflow, we had a nice training. And from my point of view, it was kind of finished. And oh, also I um, implemented an experiment set data type. And here I've written y yatic and yatic stands for why yet another data type in Galaxy, because this is something I'm very guilty of, where I just put data types into Galaxy thinking that they're useful, but then they're never actually used. But here I can justify that the experiment set is actually a widely used data set for, um, for uh, omics essays and, and R. So hopefully this will actually be used by other tools, not just by music. Um, so I, I can justify creating this data type this time because hopefully it was used by other tools. Um, so then I passed this on to Wendy and I said, hey, this tool is finished. Like, let's, let's get this published. And uh, she showed me just very specific things which I overlooked from a developer point of view. From a developer point of view, the tool runs and it works and it's stable and it's finished, but is it useful? And this is where I began to see that actually, no, it's, it was very much primed towards a very specific use case, such as in this case, it's looking for uh, beta cell proportion for a, a phenotype factor in the bulk, uh, HbA1c, where the level of HbA1c, I think, is a marker for uh, type 2 diabetes. And as, HbA1, as your type 2 diabetes progresses, your beta cell proportion drops. So this tool is very useful at showing that specific use case, but not for um, anything else. And also, we saw that it wasn't actually comparing multiple single cell data types against multiple bulk RNA, but literally just doing a one to one comparison. So we thought, okay, we need to make this much more useful. And so, um, right, yeah, side round. Um, so this was me trying to have abstract code, which was written for a very specific purpose. And as you can see, everything is hard coded, everything is just really, really messy. And I'm surprised it got into nature communications, but 
I guess the methodology was fantastic, just the underlying code was not, which was great for them, but a nightmare for me. So I had to abstract this as much as I could. And this took some time, but finally, we actually have the second edition of the tool where you can now compare multiple single cell RNA seq um, data sets against multiple block RNA seq data sets, see them in um, a globalized uh, plot. So you can compare um, different uh, block samples against one another by looking at their different um, cell type compositions. You can also uh, look at them at, at a factor level. So if you have phenotype factors in your bulk RNA seq, uh, which um, maybe um, show different um, uh, disease phenotypes, and you can compare them um, in a sort of unified kind of way. Um, so that I thought was quite nice. And um, yeah, for future work, we're going to put together this multi-factor uh, tutorial based on uh, this extended version of the, of the tool. Uh, we're going to use it for capstone projects for undergraduates who can then study their um, Perform their own research using um, these, these um, um, single uh, these uh, bulk RNA seq decomposition tools, and we're going to exist uh, integrate it with the existing um, tutorials in Galaxy by just simply um, uh, creating just uh, buffer workflows where you extract essays from uh, existing single cell RNA seq data sets and then just feeding them straight into the new. And um, if anybody wants to try this out, then uh, we're having a workshop tomorrow. It's going to be a crash course in single cell, uh, essentially taking you from raw reads to clustering. It's very interactive. It's um, kind of gamified. If you're into board games, I encourage you all to come. Um, and then we'll have bulk RNA decomposition. So then we'll take you from the clustering stage to the deconvolved RNA stage. And um, yeah, so yes. So with that, I want to thank uh, Wendy from the Open University and her team. Um, Dian and Pavan from the Galaxy Project team and the Galaxy community in general, and um, my team, uh, the Arnold Lab, um, for their support. Thank you. Any questions? So really, really cool stuff, and I like that you you took it and you you pushed the changes back upstream. Um, what what was your feeling on like? Were, were people uh, happy that you, you improved their code? And, and it really sounds like this should be another paper then. Right. Uh, no, so interestingly, I didn't push it upstream. I was thinking about it, but because the content package which I took, um, that content package was actually behind from the GitHub source code. So I, just, I forked off an old version of their code. So at this point, I'm not even sure if I could even replace onto, their, on, onto, the, onto the original um, project. And um, yeah, given the rewrites and the extension, I do kind of think it's its own standalone tool, but I don't want to step on any toes by like making it its, its own tool because the underlying methodology is there, right? All I did was just repackage it in a nicer, more abstract kind of way. So it's more useful, I guess, what I've done, but it's more, um, the theory is that. So is that enough for me to walk it up into its own tool? I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Have you been in communication with their team? No. <laughs> yeah, but um, maybe then maybe I should maybe I should try to yeah merge it into the upstream code. Yeah, I, I would strongly recommend that. Otherwise, you will end up supporting this way longer than you want to. Best to invest the original developers if you can. I would also think and assume that they will be very happy about this. But and if not, it's a red flag. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we are over time. So if you have any other further questions, please reach out on Slack as before. Of course.